I'm here with James W. Lowen, the co-editor of the Confederate and Neo-Confederate Reader, The Great Truth About the Lost Cause. Welcome to Jackson, Mississippi, in the offices of UPM. I've been to Jackson many times, but thanks. <laughs> Good. I lived here. Indeed you did. Uh, tell me, what moved you to put this reader together? What moved me is very, very simple, it, because we know it so badly. Uh, and by we, I mean especially K-12 teachers. Um, as some viewers will know, I wrote a bestseller called Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong. And uh, it sold over a million copies, still keeps selling. So as a result, I am called on a lot to go to big teacher groups like oh, the statewide council for the social studies or the national council for the social studies or big school districts or whatever. I'm sometimes talking to 200, 400 teachers at a time. And especially for the last three years or so, four years, I've been asking them, why did the Confederacy secede? Why did South Carolina, followed by 10 other states, leave the Union? I always get four answers. I get slavery, states' rights, the election of Lincoln, and tariffs and taxes, or issues about tariffs and taxes. And then I say, okay, I want you to choose one. You may think it's number two plus number three, but choose your best answer. This is not Chicago, you can only vote once. Uh, <laughs> and then we vote. Well, the results have been disheartening to anybody who cares about getting it right, and I'm all about getting it right. That's, that's my passion. Um, typically, states' rights wins 60 to 75% of the vote. Now, you might say, what's wrong with that? And what's wrong with that is everything. Um, <laughs> it's not true. Can I read you from this book? That would be excellent. Um, the, the key, the most important single document is titled, Declaration of the Immediate Causes Which Induce and Justify the Secession of South Carolina from the Federal Union. And this document, and many of the others in this book, prove that documents are not boring. Um, what do they say? Why are we seceding? Well, they, they tell us. Uh, they say, we assert that 14 of the states have deliberately refused for years past to fulfill their constitutional obligations, and we refer to their own statutes for the proof. Well, our constitutional obligation sounds a little vague, but they immediately go on to tell us exactly what they mean. The Constitution of the United States, in its fourth article, provides as follows, quote, No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the person to whom such service or labor may be due. Well, that is, of course, the Fugitive Slave Clause. And it's beginning to look like maybe slavery had something to do with this. <laughs> uh, and then they go on specifically to talk about states and states' rights. And it turns out that South Carolina and all the other states, because we have all 11 key documents in here, are against states' rights. Against. Against. For in, and they tell us what rights and, uh, and which states they're really upset with. The states of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, etc., Pennsylvania, Michigan, they named 16 of them, have enacted laws which either nullify the acts of Congress or render useless any attempt to execute them. So they're in favor of the national acts, and they're against the states' rights. What states' rights are we talking about? Well, mostly connected with the Fugitive Slave Act. Okay. Also, however, they're against New York because New York no longer allows what's called slavery transit. Well, slavery transit means temporary slavery, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, the rich white folks of um, uh, Columbia or Charleston, South Carolina, they don't want to spend August in, in South Carolina if they can help it. I was in South Carolina last August. I understand this motivation. <laughs> uh, they'd rather watch Broadway plays or maybe go out to the Hamptons on Long Island. But they don't want to do their own cooking, so they want to bring their cook along. Mm -hmm. And New York says, well, we're trying to run a free state. If you bring slaves into New York, they become free. Well, South Carolina is outraged at this and says so. They're also outraged, for instance, at New Hampshire and Vermont because these are states that let blacks vote. Well, heck, who votes in America was a state's right until the 15th Amendment passes, two eras after this during Reconstruction. But no, South Carolina is outraged at this. They have a national decision kind of on their side, namely the Dred Scott decision, and they mm -hmm. say these five states, have, and New York kind of, and so on, have no business letting blacks, blacks vote. This is an outrage. 
So, in short, the whole document is about slavery. And there are ten other documents like yeah, this that you've put much. in here. And Mississippi has a wonderful one. Mississippi, <laughs> Mississippi takes the same title. They just copy it from South Carolina. They say, a declaration of the immediate causes which induce and justify the secession of the state of Mississippi from the Federal Union. And, and what's it about? Well, the second paragraph lets the cat out of the bag. It doesn't at all. They display it openly for all to see. They're trying to persuade Virginia and Kentucky and other slave states to join them. And they're quite open about it. Quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of the commerce of the earth. And they go on to say that a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. Mm. So clearly, it's the S word. It's now, the S word. I, I have to say this. Anybody who says the, the election of Lincoln, that's true too. It's not an underlying cause, it's a trigger. But South Carolina and almost each of the states, when they secede, they say, the election of this black Republican, they sometimes call him, or this sectional party that is openly against slavery, this is an outrage. Mm -hmm. So that's OK. But again, why? Because Lincoln's against slavery, because the Republicans are against slavery. So in all of these documents, even if they're talking about an alternative reason out of those four that you asked the teachers, it goes right back to slavery Always. as the primary Always. motivator. Now, why can't we just face this? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask. Now, are these documents difficult to get a hold of? Are they some impossible to find? But, well, none of them are difficult now because we're all in here. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, some of them were difficult. Uh -huh. Most of them, the, the two I've read from, uh, are on the web, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody reads them. Why? Uh, well, they fell out of favor between 1890 and 1940. Oh. Right? And this is an era, and it's an era that people, historians have a name for it, but almost nobody else knows the name of it. And the name of it is the Nadir of Race Relations, or Nadir, N-A-D-I-R. It's an English language word. means the very bottom. Zenith, the yeah. low point. So the Nadir of Race Relations is this period, 1890, 1940. In this era, the United States, north as well as south, went more racist in its ideology than at any other time in our past. Uh, now, I'm not meaning to say, well, it was better to be black, say, in Mississippi in 1859 than it was in 1919. I wouldn't go that far, not at all. Nothing is worse than slavery for a whole bunch of reasons. Mm -hmm. But I am saying, well, for instance, um, in 1859, even a, a white planter, male or female, fired up as they are for slavery uh, and convinced that blacks are inferior and therefore deserve it, cannot tell themselves that slavery is an equal opportunity employer and that blacks have every opportunity to rise in the system, but they're just at the bottom. I mean, that is obviously patently false. Um, on the other hand, in 1919, they can say that. They can say, why are these black folks living in this terrible part of town? Why are they all janitors and stuff? Well, of course, we wouldn't let them be industrial workers, but but we can kind of hide that. We can say, look, it can't be slavery. They've been out of slavery for two generations now. It must be their own fault. And so that's what we did say. And across the north, sundown towns come into being in that period. Those are all white towns that are all white on purpose. I wrote, I wrote a book about sundown towns in the north. But mm -hmm. across the south, a new rationale for the Civil War takes hold. Now, we don't say we sla succeeded for slavery. Now we say we seceded for states' rights, even though it's completely opposite to the truth. So wait, this isn't just an innocent error that's getting propagated. No, people knew better. And one of the best um, items in here, really, is an item, a letter uh, by Mosby, General Mosby. The, the, he was called the Gray Ghost of the Confederacy, yes. the cavalry leader in Virginia. And he's still alive in 1890 or 91, uh, approximately, when he writes this letter. And he's just angry at this misrepresentation. Um, he says, uh, look, South Carolina told you why she seceded, and don't you think she should know? And <laughs> he proceeds to say, it was about slavery. I'm not ashamed of it. He's, he's not saying he's for slavery anymore. He's saying, we did this. You know, for better or worse, we did this. Let's just be honest about it. But his was a voice crying in the wilderness. Everybody else is trying to cover it over. The official position of the United Daughters of the Confederacy was, it was states' rights. And um, that's pretty much their position to this day. Well, now that's an interesting letter, the Mosby letter, to include in this, because one of the questions I was going to ask you is that pedagogically, if you've brought a student to the point 
where they are recognizing what the document said and what the motivation for the secession and the Civil War was. Where do you take them next? Does this Mosby letter in some way help them understand uh, history in a way that they can cope with this great biblical evil that, no, that occurred? Mm -hmm. Well, I think so. Uh, in particular, I think what this book shows is historiography. Uh -huh. That is to say, when we write about secession, helps determine what we write about secession. Mm -hmm. When we write about secession in 1860, when we're doing it, we say this, we're seceding for slavery, we're seceding against states' rights, we are seceding because of the election of this anti-slavery candidate, and tariffs and taxes has nothing to do with it. But when we write about it between 1890 and 1940, then we say something quite different. And so you can literally see this happening right before your very eyes in this book. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing about it is that the ideology of the neo-confederate, we have to call them neo-confederates of course because the original confederates are all dead. These are their intellectual heirs. Okay, um, I was going to ask you what yeah. the definition of a neo-confederate uh, was. So, to this day, it's still changing. And mm. the most recent document in the book is um, it's a, a very good one, I think. It's the confederate proclamation, the, the proclamation by Sonny Perdue, governor of Georgia, two years ago, for Confederate History Month in March of 2008. And, and here's the new twist, and it's not just his, a lot of people are saying this now. Um, I'll, I'll read it verbatim from here. Proclamations have all these whereases, so this is a whereas. Mm -hmm. Whereas, among those who served the Confederacy were many African Americans, both free and slave, who saw action in the Confederate armed forces in many combat roles. Well, no, they didn't. They actually <laughs> didn't. Now, they might have if they had been allowed to, but it was a principle of the Confederate government that black folks cannot make and do not make good soldiers. And they were outraged when the United States finally let blacks be soldiers beginning January 1st, 1863. And there are instances throughout the Civil War of both black POWs and also the white officers of black units who, after being captured, were then executed. Were were murdered because you know it's a war crime to kill somebody who you already have immobilized by imprisoning them by making them a POW. In fact, you've got a piece in there about yeah. the Fort Pillow massacre that is that is extremely. Yeah. Uh, it was Confederate policy. People mm -hmm. uh, after the war, people kind of fuzzed over that and said, "Well, no, this was just in the heat of battle." Uh -huh. But we have documents from a guy named Jefferson Davis from his Secretary of War, from the Confederate Congress, saying that this is appropriate policy. These people, anyway, we won't stick on that, except to say that um, the Confederacy finally reversed itself three weeks before losing control of Richmond. Okay. And at that point, they allow black soldiers. Well, that did not, the governor of, of uh, Georgia is hardly talking about the 300 folks that they let be soldiers in the last three weeks of the war. They never even got into action some people say, some people say they kind of were in one skirmish or something like that. Mm -hmm. Many African Americans, free and slave, who saw action in the Confederate armed forces in many combat roles. Why does he then write that? He doesn't write it because it happened, because it didn't happen. So we have to think about why, and I think that's useful. I mean, my introductions help you think about why. I was going to ask you about the introductions, and, and I wanted you to make it clear to viewers that this is not a document dump. There is right. throughout this book a set of introductions that tell a narrative that help shape the uh, the book sure. and give guidance to yeah. where you're going with it. What what were you shooting for in these introductions? Well, uh, first of all, I'm trying to show uh, that why the why the Confederacy existed, why it did secede, mm -hmm. and then what it was about during its five year four four year existence. Um, and so we do that with the introductions, taking you through the, the introduction to the whole book and then the introduction to each of the six chapters. And also the, each document has an introduction because some of the documents, um, there's, they're kind of obscure unless you, unless you help the reader. So oh. we try to help the reader say, well, here's the significant points of this document. Here's what it's, where it's going. Here, and, and then we also are trying to show them the historiography of it, the, the idea that what you say depends on when you say it. Um, and so we really take the, the reader right up to the present, and I, the, the key point I want to get across about the present is today, and for the last 30 years anyway, since the Civil Rights Movement, 
the push has no longer been about white supremacy. Uh, in the period 1890 to 1940, the neo-Confederates were absolutely still in favor of white supremacy, and quite openly, but they were not in favor of slavery. But now, they're no longer openly in favor of white supremacy. Now, it is kind of David against Goliath. Uh, we, we did it for states' rights, and the reason the governor says this, black folks were on our side, or at least a bunch of them were. They were on both sides. So, see, it couldn't have been about slavery. It couldn't have been about white supremacy. Else, why would we have had all these thousands of blacks in our army in combat roles? Well, we didn't. And even if we had it as a non sequitur, um, we could still have been about white supremacy. You know, Hitler had a bunch of Jewish officers. Uh, there's a, a whole book about them. Uh, this does not prove that Hitler was not about anti Semitism. He was. Um, so the idea is then that um, we need to demystify the Confederacy so that we realize what it really was about. Um, last night, I was talking uh, with, a, with a resident of Mississippi who's, um, I think he's a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Certainly he has every right to be because he has Confederate forebears. Mm -hmm. um, and we had an absolutely honest understanding. I mean, he agreed uh, after he uh, heard me out and read these, uh, or heard me read uh, these documents, that the Confederacy was all about slavery. This does not mean that he can't be uh, appreciative of the sacrifice of his forebears, of, of those of them who lost their lives in the struggle, uh, who fought honorably on behalf. You really wind up fighting for the guy next to you more than you are fighting for some cause anyway, because uh, you don't you, know, you don't want to let him down, and you hope he doesn't want to let you down. Mm -hmm. um, all of those kinds of things are, are perfectly valid, but we have to realize it wasn't the best cause. It really was about white supremacy. And of course, the, later on, during the Nader, the North got into its own licks on white supremacy. So this isn't a matter of pointing the blame at anybody. Okay, so this, so, so this spread throughout the country. I know there's a, there's a yeah. part in the book where you talk about a key moment in uh, Northern Republican yeah. policy. Yeah. What was that about and what happened? In 1890, uh, three things happened. Uh, and that's why we date the Nader to exactly 1890. Okay. Uh, the first one, uh, well, they all happened near the end of the year, and I don't know which one happened first, but uh, <laughs> the first one I'm going to talk about is um, <laughs> what used to be called the Battle at Wounded Knee. And now South Dakota has pretty much renamed it the Massacre at Wounded Knee, which is more accurate. And at this point, the Lakota or Sioux people go into their Nader period for sure, and Native Americans all across the country lose the last shards of, of independence. Um, terrible. Second, the um, state of Mississippi passes its new constitution. This new constitution, everybody states openly, is for the purpose of removing blacks from citizenship, from voting, from being on juries. And even though this flies in the teeth of the 14th and 15th amendments to the constitution, the U.S. does nothing. Seeing this, every other southern state and states as far away as Oklahoma follows suit by 1907. And of course, once you have done that, you have to rationalize it. Why did you do it? Uh, votes, blacks were still voting. A lot of people don't realize this as recently as 1888, and in other southern states up to 1902 or 1904 when they followed suit. Mm -hmm. um, they maybe weren't voting freely, but sometimes they were. But now, if you keep them from voting, what's your rationale? It has to be that they are inferior, that they shouldn't be voting, that they are too stupid to vote. They aren't, or at the very least, they're too uneducated to vote, and maybe later. Um, so it just increases racism to do this. It doesn't help. And then the third thing that happened was the Republicans, who were the party of, of uh, anti-racism at the time, mm -hmm. the Republicans failed to pass, more or less by a single vote, a federal elections bill, it was called, of 1890. They passed the House, didn't pass the Senate, would have been signed into law by the Republican President, Benjamin Harrison. After they failed to pass it, the Democrats did what they always did. They tried to tar the Republicans. You people are nothing but a bunch of nigger lovers, they said. Mm -hmm. um, it's an outrage. Well, the Republicans used to reply, no, it's an outrage what you guys are doing to, at the polls every November election in the South. Somebody needs to stand up for these poor black folks. But in 1891, they had a new reply. And the new reply was, no, we aren't. Remember the charge? No, we aren't. Mm -hmm. and, and at this point, blacks are without political allies. So for all three of these reasons, we go into the Nader period for sure. And again, even if you're in New Hampshire, even if you're in Montana, you have to rationalize this. And you can say, well, I'm a 
white American, and I believe in democracy and equal rights for all, and I'm proud of the United States, except I didn't do anything about Mississippi's new constitution. I'm not, you know, this is a, I'm a schmuck. I'm not really living up to, we don't want to say that about ourselves. No. So instead we say, <laughs> Um, except for those black folks. Now, those Southerners, those white Southerners, they probably know what they're talking about. They're not, those black folks are not ready for citizenship yet. And it's an easy step from there to say, I'm going to keep them out of my town. And so town after town across the North, not even knowing anything about African Americans, kept them out. That's part of this story, too, in a way. I was going to say, we, we, we have focused at the beginning of this conversation a lot about the Civil War and about the period directly after, but really this book carries... Uh, documents concerning the Confederacy or neo-Confederate thought all the way through the present day. You were reading from a, a document by a Georgia governor in what, 2008? 2008? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So quite a long time. Now there are documents from 1903 and 1906 that are uh, quite amazing. Yeah. Uh, and and um, maybe touch on some of those and, and then I think as, as a kind of close, uh, touch on um, the overall goal of what you would, the one thing that you would like is to see a teacher do with this book that would just delight you. Okay. Um, I think this book needs to accomplish two things. If it accomplished those two things, it would be well worth the publishing and well worth the writing and the collecting. Mm -hmm. First, um, Every, what I want a reader to do with it is buy the book, but then keep it nice. Uh, don't, <laughs> okay. don't take notes in it. Take notes on the side on a piece of paper. And then give it to the history teacher you had or the history teacher your kids are about to have. And slap them upside the head with it and say, look, we got to get this right. 150 years of lying and distortion about the Confederacy is enough. We're up to the, the sesquicentennial between now and... 2015, it's time to get it right. That's the first thing. And the second thing I want people to do is I want them to learn about that there was this period, the nadir of race relations, 1890 to 1940, and learn its impact on us today. Because nobody knows it. Black folks don't understand it. White folks, Cambodian immigrants, they don't understand. They haven't heard the term. Um, this is the most important term, uh, period in terms of race relations in our country, I think. It leaves us with two legacies. First, distorted history. It distorted in this case about the Civil War and distorted about numerous other things, even Columbus. We won't go there right now, but even Columbus. Mm -hmm. And second of all, besides distorted history, this nadir of race relations leaves us with black folks systematically excluded from all kinds of jobs and all kinds of communities. So we wind up with white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods in cities. We didn't used to have that. We wind up with sundown towns. We wind up with black folks being, for instance, unable to be working in the breweries in Milwaukee except as janitors. Well, if you can't be a brewer in Milwaukee, un unable to be department store clerks in Chicago. Mm -hmm. If you can't be a department store clerk, I mean, we're not talking about being kept out of, say, being a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon. We're talking about being kept out of the basic jobs that, that caused working class families to survive. That's why black folks are poor today, because of what happened in the nadir not because of slavery. Now, of course, the nadir relates ideologically to slavery. But in 1890, we took a wrong turn as a nation, and we took it as a whole nation, not just the South. And that's what this book documents as well. So if we can get the Confederacy and secession taught right, and then we can also get the nadir taught, we're, you know, we're moving into the 21st century ready to really make some progress in terms of how we run the country about race relations. Good. Well, thanks so much. I've been talking with James W. Lowen, the, the co-editor of The Confederate and Neo-Confederate Reader, The Great Truth About the Lost Cause.